please do speak. And I'm going to tell you about how we took a bacterial protein and tried to evolve it into something that looks and behaves remarkably similar to viruses. And so our idea was we were trying to get a cellular protein to package its own genetic information in order to see whether the hypothesis that viruses could have emerged from cellular proteins that learn how to kind of go rogue is experimentally testable. And to do that, we started from the lumazin synthase of Equifex eolicus, ALS for friends. And this is actually an enzyme, so an enzymatic cage composed of 12 of these pentamers and it's structurally unrelated to any known virus. The idea that Naohiro Terasaka, who is now an assistant professor at the University of Tokyo had, so his idea was he would take this monomer, now here you see a monomer of the lumazin synthase, which has its termini to the outside, and he relocated those to the inside so that we, he could append uh, so by circular permutation so that he could append a peptide this is a phage anti-terminator peptide that is known to bind specifically an RNA stem loop sequence called box B. And so the idea was he would take the open read or the coding region for this new construct with the circular permutation with the peptide attached, put it into an RNA that has box B tags at the flanking regions. This would help at the flanking regions in the untranslated region. And that should hopefully allow a capsid to form that through the interaction between these peptide tags and the RNA could encapsulate its own genetic information. When now here I expressed this in coli, what he saw was that the original wild type capsid immediately started to expand into these larger capsids. It did contain RNA, but you can also see that they're very fragmented, they're partially broken, they're heterogeneous. And so what actually happened when he looked where they managed to contain their own RNA was rather a picture like this, where they're partially fragmented, ill-formed, and the, they, though they did contain RNA, it was a lot of fragments and also a significant portion of just random E. coli RNA. So we set out to, um, so I set out to characterize these structures by cryo-EM. And here you see on the left a micrograph and you really see how heterogeneous these were. And on the right, you see several of the 2D classes that I had to do with a bunch of masks. It was a lot of classification, but you see individual features. And some of these could even be reconstructed. For example, these three classes up here eventually led to a structure like this. This is really fascinating because it's very different from what we are used to seeing from viruses. But what you could do is you could fit one of the pentamers of the lumazine synthase into the structure and you see this oddly tetrahedrally shaped capsid with these large pores composed out of 120 subunits. I could also take these classes, for example, again, do the reconstruction and get 180 mer, again, fully made out of pentamers, fully with these large pores. So what we clearly see is that this original design sticks with the pentameric subunits that we have in the wild type. And that obviously leads to these large pores. So to improve the original design, we went out to, um, evolve it further. And we did this evolution by initially um, random mutagenesis of uh, creating new variants and then putting them through selective pressure. First, by purifying with, by affinity and then size exclusion, we, uh, we looked for specifically well-assembled capsids, then treated those with nucleases to choose only capsids that would be uh, capable of protecting the nucleic acids that they carry. And lastly, we uh, reverse transcribed the RNA and re-ligated the DNA in the plasmids so that we would select for, in, uh, for capsids capable of taking the full length genome on the inside. And we did this over several generations leading from nuclear capsid one to nuclear capsid four. And by the end, if you actually analyze the RNA content, because we did want specific encapsulation of full length RNA, this is what happened. 
So on the left, you see a gel of the total RNA with this IVT standing for the in vitro transcribed RNA that we were hoping to package containing the full information for the capsid protein. And then over generations one, two, three, and four, you see that actually in the fourth generation, we quite specifically package a transcript of the right length. And on the right, you see a specifically fluorescently labeled um, gel because we did introduce box, um, we did introduce broccoli optomers in the RNA design as well, that we could specifically stain and we really see that the fourth and final variant specifically incorporates its own genetic information and actually with a remarkable efficiency of uh, two to three um, RNA molecules per capsid. And so I set out again to try to characterize this variant structurally. This is the original map that we got and we could fit the individual monomers of the lumazine synthase quite well. And I do have four colors in here because it really looks like a T equals four capsid with four quasi equivalent chains. In red, you can see pentamers or pentagons at least, and this are like hexagonal patches. But when I went further to actually correct, uh, to look into more details, how these would fit, we were in for a surprise and the fit wasn't actually perfect. And in particular, there is one portion of this protein where you see the fit is completely off. And what happened quite surprisingly is this kind of domain swap. And with this domain swap, we actually start to reorganize the entire lattice of this capsule quite significantly from the original kind of pentameric building blocks, as you'll see now, because you start to form these trimers. Whoops, sorry. So this is now the, uh, the new actual properly fit version with all these domain swaps integrated, still with the same coloring. You see how it's intricate, how, for example, the yellow, uh, this yellow uh, monomer would kind of grab onto the red one. So this goes like from here to here and they grab onto each other. And to see this a bit better, here you'd have a red monomer, a green one and a yellow one. And they interact with each other in these trimeric fashions and then also overlap with neighboring trimers that would like appear here, here and here. So what we do think happened throughout evolution is that the monomer that now has the ability to do this domain swap actually can form these trimeric building blocks and that as opposed to the pentameric building blocks that we see in the early generations allowed to form this T4 like capsid. Lastly, what's also quite interesting to see, we do know that the pentamer in the original wild type is um, very rigid in terms of structure. Whereas now that we have this domain swap around this kind of loop region that with about this hinge that separates the two parts of the swapped domains now also allows the flexibility that's necessary for these four quasi equivalent um, chains to uh, be able to make up the full 240 mil. So I did characterize actually all the variants throughout the entire evolutionary progress. And um, we'll see that in generations three and four, we finally see these icosahedral structures that really look very similar to virus-like capsids. Um, I would like to mention that these larger pores here appear still to be like, and they may actually be partially a, a artifact of the icosahedral symmetry because here is also where the lambda and plus peptides dock onto, but those um, are connected by flexible linkers. So they're probably obstructing the pores even further, but do not show in the reconstructions with icosahedral symmetry. And that's corroborated by the fact that these capsids are actually capable of protecting their encapsulated RNA from RNAs even for several days in vitro. There is one question that I will not be able to talk about much right now, unfortunately, but it is surprising that from generation three to four, although the structure didn't change, we saw that the selectivity in RNA pack packaging was um, remarkably improved. And in that, uh, to solve that question, Raidun Tarok and Peter Stockley, who are also listening in, um, helped us out with uh, their expertise in X-ray footprinting. And so they looked for us into the structures uh, or into the ensemble structures of these RNAs encapsulated by these variants. 
And what they helped us figure out, what we believe is actually happening to improve the RNA packaging specificity is that not just the protein, but also the genomes evolved in a way, or so-called genomes evolved in a way to specifically expose certain packaging signals in a well-conserved um, fashion among the entire RNA ensemble. And so the final variant is not only more virus-like in structure, but really has these RNA virus-like packaging signals that have emerged, emerged throughout evolution. So with that, I'd like to thank everyone, particularly the Hilbert group that I did this work in, and now Hiro who started this work, and Angela who did the biochemical characterization, our collaborators, Raidun, Peter, and Nena to help with the CryoM and the CryoM staff, the SMELT group. And if you want to know more about this, this has recently been published, so you can read it up, or you can contact me at my new address now in the UK as well at the LMB. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. Very interesting talk. Um, there is a question from Caleb. Did you try solving the structure without imposing icosahedral symmetry averaging to eliminate the possible poor artifacts? I did try, but it's a bit, uh, so it wouldn't really go anywhere. The, the shell, like the signal from the shell is way too strong. And it's so these, the artifacts that I mentioned, I mean, it's not really artifacts, it's just kind of canceling out the signal of these tags that are connected by flexible linkers. I don't think we could really see them. And we just have indirect evidence that they must somehow obstruct the pores simply due to the RNA, RNA's resistance. Mm 